Okay, so it's really a pleasure for me to, to be here, and I'm grateful to, to, to Maria, to Mathieu, and to Robert for organizing this, uh, this summer school and for, for inviting me. Uh, indeed, <coughs> I'm going to, to discuss things which are which is beautiful. I, I hope to convince everybody that it is indeed. And it's going to be about quantum spin systems and phase transitions. So, so they are relevant. I mean, they have been relevant in, uh, in science for already, in, in physics for already uh, several decades. But there are still a uh, lot of things to, to, to discover and many applications uh, of actual relevance. So let me describe first the, the contents. So um, there will be four hours of lectures, so actually four lectures. And the, the first one, this very hour, is going to be about the, the background and the setting. Then, in the second hour, I, I hope I will have the time to, to give you a proof of decay of correlation in two dimensions. This is the famous Bermin Wagner theorem with a very nice proof which I, I learned recently by Jörg Frölich. Then the, oh sorry, that's the first part. And the second part should be the, um, a proof of long range order in the 3D classical Heisenberg model. So this is a beautiful proof uh, of Frölich Simon, uh, sorry, Frölich Simon Spencer. Uh, about the, the breaking of a continuous symmetry, which is proved using uh, the so-called meth method of so-called reflection positivity and infrared bounds. For those who, who are really interested in quantum systems, well, the motivation to, to, to give it here is really as a preparation for understanding the, the proof for quantum systems. The proof of quantum systems follows pretty much the one for the classical systems, but with extra complications. So it's, it really helps to, to see uh, already the ideas in the classical system. So then, uh, tomorrow, during the first hour, I plan to, to, to give you the proof of long range order in the 3D quantum Heisenberg model, Heisenberg antiferromagnet, uh, the proof due to Dyson Lip Simon. And, uh, oh, yes, sorry. I'm from now on, I write bigger. And, um, and the last uh, hour will be something more recent for, for which I've been uh, close, I mean, more involved. Uh, this will be about the random loop, random loop representations for quantum Heisenberg models, how to derive them and what we can learn from them. So, okay, so this is the, the topic of, our, of those four, four hours. There will be handwritten lecture notes which will be available soon. I, I think they are being scanned right now, and hopefully they will be available before the beginning of the afternoon from my web page. Uh, should I maybe, maybe I can give you the, a link which is hopefully the, going to be the, the right one. So, link to lecture notes. These are handwritten lecture notes, I should warn you. So this, uh, this will be on my web page, so www.ulchi.org slash, and then I can just say something like uh, marseille.pdf, I guess. Okay. So let me start with uh, with the beginning and the, a little bit of background, and then I'd like to to introduce the, the setting, including to, to remind or to, to to teach you about the the usual spin operators. So the, what we are going to to discuss is mainly about ferromagnetism. So ferromagnetism. Uh, is something quite uh, quite old. I mean, it's uh, it's interesting to reflect that it, the discovery of magnets is definitely before the discovery of writing. So it's really uh, extremely old. People have noticed some uh, strange properties of, of, of materials able to attract or, or repel, see, repel each other. And uh, 
so I should write to bigger, sorry, uh, not to remind me. So, so this is something uh, quite old, I mean, and also the, there were applications, early applications by the Chinese using compasses. The, the proper description is much, uh, much later. So what happens, uh, uh, I mean, it can, be, uh, ma uh, sorry, magnetic materials can be described using thermodynamics, and the thermodynamic description, so thermodynamic description, well, so you know that uh, from the second principle of thermodynamics, there exists an entropy which has nice properties. Here, one can formulate it as the existence of uh, so-called free energy, which is a function from temperature, or rather the inverse temperature, beta, and the, the external magnetic field, H. And uh, this function is concave. So what the second principle of thermodynamics says is that there must exist such function. The, the precise form of this function, of course, depends on the material. But no, nonetheless, there must exist such functions. It has to be con concave jointly in both parameters. And from there, you, you get uh, uh, so-called derived quantities. So important quantities like the magnetization, is given by, so let's write it as m beta h, is given as the, uh, sorry, the derivative of f with respect to h, or precisely minus df over dh. And then you also have the magnetic susceptibility which is, uh, let's write, let's use the letter kappa, this is a of beta h, and this is the second derivative of f with respect to, to h. So, so then, these things uh, are supposed to exist. There are some basic properties which people have observed, um, which is that, um, I mean, a little bit about the, the basic shapes. The, the shape is like that. So if I draw here h and f of beta h, then it's going to be a concave function. And for, for small beta, which means high temperatures, the picture looks like that. By the way, there, there is also an obvious symmetry h minus h. And so this would be for, for beta small, precisely bit, beta smaller than some critical beta. And then there, there is the other situation where beta is large, which corresponds to small temperatures, and then the picture looks more like that. So it's also a smooth function from uh, both sides, but it has uh, a jump in the derivative in the, at h equals zero. So this would be beta larger than beta c. And, um, and so this jump is, of course, very important. And the, the derivative, I mean, the, the right derivative here gives you the so-called spontaneous magnetization. So this is uh, how to, to describe thermodynamically the property that the magnet retains the, the magnetization uh, at low temperatures. So some words which are quite uh, important. Can I still move? OK. Everybody can see it, or how is it? Uh, or should I raise the, the board? No. So it's uh, good to know what those things are called. So one of the beta C is like a critical temperatures, temperature, and this is also called the Curie temperature, in honor of Marie Curie. And uh, and then the spontaneous magnetization is minus the derivative from the right side of f at zero. So spontaneous magnetization. So, so this is what, uh, what can be observed and indeed measured for, for certain materials. By the way, who, who can uh, give me some my, uh, thermagnetic materials. Just to 
Well, the first one is easy. Ferromagnetic, everybody speaking French should know the answer. Okay, I'm not uh, iron for, for those non -spe not speaking French. Uh, what, other, what else? Of course, I, I had a head start, I looked it up. Well, it turns out that cobalt, nickel, gadolinium, dysprosium, and this is the full list of uh, ferromagnetic elements, and then you have composite substances. So, but there, there are several, and, uh, and one would like to, to understand them. So, what the goal here is, of course, to understand them from a statistical mechanics perspective, so we need to, uh, to understand the microscopic description. So, now we introduce... Maybe I'm going to split this. So, now I'd like to introduce quantum spin systems. So, so what we should start with is that we have elementary particles such as atoms and electrons and they interact uh, through Coulomb forces, and we would like to understand all the properties starting from this. This is totally impossible. So, so what we are going to, to do, and what all the people in condensed matter physics do, is that they assume the existence of condensed matter. So we assume that for some reason, atoms form a lattice, and we still, uh, I mean, we are going to work from, uh, from there. So this is the, the thing, assume, Condensed matter. So then, the, I mean, naively, we, we have some periodic lattice like ZD, and I'm only going to, to talk about ZD here, but many of uh, the ideas are much more general. And, um, and then, so the atoms are, are from now on going to, to be localized over there. What about the elections? Well, even if you, uh, if you fix the atoms, for the electrons, they should be described by a Schrodinger equation. It's still something uh, totally, I mean, extremely complicated. Besides, they carry spins, that's very important. So what we are going to assume is that uh, electrons are essentially localized on the sides of, uh, of a lattice, and they still interact with, with neighbors, and the interaction is only through their spins. So the, the origin of this interaction, well, we are not going to, to touch it. It may be electrons moving back and forth, or, uh, or some other more subtle things. But what we are going to assume is that uh, every point of a lattice is, is hosting a spin, and then we will uh, introduce a, an effective interaction between neighbor, neighboring spins. So the setting is that uh, uh, we need uh, a lattice or a graph. I'm going to, to use the notation lambda and E. This is supposed to be a calligraphic E. It's going to to, to appear several times in this lecture, no, I mean in these lectures. So lambda e is a finite graph. So for for instance, think of one to l to to d. Lambda is a set of vertices, so this is this set, and e is the set of nearest neighbors uh, over here. And we fix a, a spin variable for the total spin. So the parameter s is a half integer. So it's, it belongs to one half n. Half integer or integer. And the state space for, for the quantum, spi quantum spin system, so state space. So you know that in quantum mechanics, the state space has the, the structure of a Hilbert space. So the state space is the Hilbert space. And let me write what's supposed to be a H calligraphic. And it's going to be a tensor product over each side of the lattice of, and at each side we have C 2S plus 1. So this is the local Hilbert space, C to S plus 1, and then we take the tensor uh, of, this, um, of this space. So there, there is uh, something, some of you might be disappointed to see that uh, our Hilbert space is going to be a finite dimensional Hilbert space. 
So all operators will be bounded operators, and there won't be much uh, difficulties associated with function analysis. At the same time, somehow linear algebra is not totally helpful because the dimension of this space is, is huge. It's exponential of exponential, and there's no hope to, to write things in terms of matrices. But certainly, as far as mathematics, uh, mathematical setting is concerned, we are dealing with matrices throughout. So next, the spin operators. So let me first describe the spin operators on just one of those, uh, of those Hilbert spaces. So maybe let me give a little title, spin operators. So on C 2s plus 1, by the way, I reached the, the right size for, for, the, for the writing, or I hope so. Nobody is complaining in the back, so it's good. So on C 2s plus 1, usual spin operators. And uh, I'm going to denote them S1, S2, S3, so these are parameters, these are not powers. Uh, that satisfy. And they satisfy the standard uh, properties. First, they are omissions. The second, when you take the, the, the sum of the square, you get identity. So S1 squared plus S2 square plus S3 square. And you get uh, actually S times S plus 1 times the identity you know, in uh, C2S plus 1. And uh, next, very important, are the commutation relations they satisfy. Namely, if you take the commutation between, commutator between S1 and S2, you get I S3. And I'm not going to, to write, but you have all the other commutation relations obtained by cyclicity. So 1, 2 gives 3, 2, 3 gives 1, and 3, 1 gives 2. So, so spin operators satisfying this. And it's enough to, to, to get already interesting properties out of that. And let me write this as a proposition 1.1, which is that, uh, first, uh, spin operators exist. So it's not entirely trivial as far as I'm concerned, but it's not too hard either, once we know how to, to do it. Indeed, to construct explicitly operators satisfying those commutation relations. And uh, B, it turns out that the spectrum is uh, only decided by those uh, relations here. So each SI has eigenvalues minus S, minus S plus 1, up to plus S. And so you have already two S plus 1 eigenvalues, so indeed, uh, it forms a complete set of eigenvalues with multiplicity one. So, so this uh, exists, and out of commutation relations, one can prove those properties. It's a very nice exercise, and which I urge you to to do. And you, you might need a little uh, hints if you have never seen it uh, before. Let me just give you the, the example. In the simplest case, which is S equals one half, and those spin operators can be written explicitly in terms of Pauli matrices. Pauli matrices form one choice for, for such operators. So we have Pauli matrices. And uh, I remind you what they are. S1 is like one half zero one one zero. S2 is one half zero, never remember, but yeah, minus i, i zero, and s3 is one half, one zero, zero minus one. And um, 
So in particular, you can check that S3 has the right uh, spectrum. So these are the, the spin operators. They satisfy those properties. Now let me give you some uh, some more I mean more properties. First, some notation. So, sorry. Let me divide here. So notation, if A is a vector in R3, I'm going to use the notation S indexed by the vector A. This means A in a product with S. This is just notation for A1, S1, plus A2, S2, plus A3, S3. Okay, so then we have spin operators uh, for any vector A. And then we can check that we have the following properties. First, the, the commutation relations over there extend by linearity to those. If you take the commutator between SA and SB, two vectors in R3, then what you get is I times S A cross B. So in the special case where A is like E1, B is E2, then you get E3, and this is, uh, this is what is already written. But you can check that it works, uh, it extends by linearity to, to this. Then something uh, extremely important for, for symmetries, which is like exponential minus I, SA, SB, exponential I, SA, so you recognize the structure exponential i times uh, a Hermitian matrix is a unitary operator, and this is a standard unitary transformation applied to, to matrices. So here, the, the interpretation is that you rotate the spin b around a. And indeed, what you get is s, and one can write it like that, r a of b. So this vector here is the vector b, rotated around A by angle A. Maybe I should write it. This is um, vector B rotated around A by angle the Euclidean norm of A. And and so this is, uh, this is really an important relation. The proof, I'm going to, to leave it as an exercise. Let me know if you'd like me to, to write it down somewhere. The, the best way is probably to, I mean, here you can put the A over here and choose maybe the directions, and then it depends on the parameter. You differentiate both sides and you check that it satisfies the same differential equations. So some tricks like that. Certainly don't try to, to go through uh, some matrix description. Uh, this is going to be fundamental because here we have uh, symmetry operations applied to, to spin models, and we'll understand a lot of properties by applying rotations. And this is related to, to rotations. So. Now I'd like to, to go back to, uh, to the model. So back to the, to the big space H lambda. And we are going to, to understand those spins as acting in this uh, Hilbert space. Uh, so the notation will be as follows, which is that uh, the spin operator in the direction i at site x means the operator which one gets by tensoring si and the identity everywhere else. Uh, I assume that everybody knows enough about tensor products not to be, uh, to, to be much in trouble. So, so then we have a spin operators at every site, and they satisfy those commutation relations when they, they constant the same site, and operators at different sites just commute. And uh, then we, 
I can introduce the natural Hamiltonians. The natural Hamiltonians for spin systems. And these are the Heisenberg ferromagnet and anti-ferromagnet. Let me write them down. So we can write this like that. So H of lambda, little h, ferro, means the, oh sorry. It means minus the sum over nearest neighbors. I'm going to use this notation. X, Y belonging to E means two pairs, I mean two sides X and Y, such that they are nearest neighbors. The, this really means the set X, Y, the order does not matter. Uh, Sx times Sy minus H sum over X in lambda. Sx3. And this, uh, this is also a shortcut for, for an operator in, uh, in the product Hx tensored with Hy, or C2s tensored with C, sorry, C2s plus 1 tensored with C2s plus 1. And uh, this is just Sx1 plus SXSY2 plus SXSY3. So this in a product really means just this notation here. And, uh, and this re represents ferromagnetic interactions because of the sign minus in order to, to diminish, I mean naively to, to diminish these Hamiltonians if the SX were really just vectors, you would have to align the vectors in, in the same directions. Then you have uh, the anti-ferromagnet model, which is minus the sum x, y in the set of edges. And then, sorry, plus this time, that's the, the important difference. And minus h sx3. For the, the last term is, of course, the, uh, the contribution to the external magnetic field h, which is assumed to be in the third direction. Or more precisely, you choose the directions of spin so that uh, this is the third direction. So that's the ferromagnet with a minus sign, the anti-ferromagnet with a plus sign. And in order to, 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 to minimize this, uh, naively, you would like to anti-align the, the neighboring spins. So let me give you some properties first. I'm going to, to give you some motivation for, for those models. First, proposition 1.3. You might, I mean, people who are carefully listening might notice that Proposition 1.3 does not quite follow from Proposition 1.1. The, the reason is that I have these lecture notes, and this is Proposition 1.3 in the lecture notes. I have, lecture notes contain definitely more material than uh, I have time to present here. So, Proposition 1.3, eigenvalues of this operator Sx times Sy, they, they can be written as follows. So this is one half j times j plus one minus s times s plus one, where j is uh, our numbers, so they are equal to zero, one, up to two s. And the multiplicity for, for given j Multiplicity is 2j plus 1. So, so it's not totally trivial to, to do this. Uh, uh, this follows from the, the properties of addition of spins. Anybody who has taken a, quantum mechanic, a class of quantum mechanics remembers that, and it's one of those nightmares. I mean, everything seems to be linear and easy, and one gets very co confused very quickly. Anyway, uh, I urge you to, to do this as an exercise. So. So let me give you an example of this. 
Maybe I have to understand how to bring down the last board and to move up. Can I do it both? No, I cannot do it two at a time. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. So, so it's actually quite advanced. But I still want this one to, to go up. Can I move up two at a time? No. So let me take this all the way up. Should I bring down the first one a little bit? OK. So let me give you an example. I mean, just to, to, to check. The case s equals 1 half. And the eigenvalues, I mean, it's very easy. The, the parameter j is either 0 or 1. And then you have the value over there. And you can check so let me divide also. Eigenvalues of this are they are just two two values, minus three fourth and one fourth. And you can check that uh, the multiplicity here is three, multiplicity is here is one, so the, the trace is zero and it should be zero indeed. And uh, I'm maybe not going to, to write this down. But this is uh, the, the eigenvector for this is called spin singlet. And the eigenvectors of this are called spin triplets. And this is also the singlet uh, uh, subspace and the triplet subspace of dimension 3. So what I like to, to give is uh, discuss a little bit about the, uh, the motivation for, for Heisenberg interactions. Because they are quite familiar at the same time. Well, one can wonder, why, why do we choose this rather than something else? And the, the reason is really about uh, rotation symmetries. So, so the thing is that if you consider the space Hx tensored with Hy, then you have uh, the symmetry group, uh, sorry, symmetry group of rotations. Rotations in R three, and they are represented by represented by the, the following operator u, which is indexed by the a vector a in direction uh, sorry in R three, and this is given by exponential i s x a plus i s x s y a. So. You apply those things, uh, I mean, u a and u star, u a star, to your operators, and this amounts to, to rotations in the, uh, the spins. And uh, then you can look at the effect of um, this symmetry group on this uh, Hilbert space here, and you see that uh, you have the following irreducible decomposition. Uh, you have that h x tensored with h y is equal to the singlet space plus the triplet. So, so then you would like to have interactions which are rotation invariant, and in order to to, to have to be rotation invariant, it must be that rotation takes. Uh, um, I mean, satisfy this uh, restriction. And when you look at the, um, at the eigenspaces, they must have exactly this decomposition. And then you have no choice for the case spin 1 half. It has to be uh, this form here. So these are the only rotation variant interactions, plus or minus Sx times Sy, up to multiplication by constants or addition uh, of, uh, of the constant terms, too. So, so this is a motivation for the spin one half Heisenberg thermo I mean, thermagnet and anti thermagnet. These are the the natural rotation invariant interactions. So, okay, 
let me write uh, just this. So this suggests this kind of interactions. So, so now I'm going to, to be a bit more, more general. And uh, in these uh, lectures, so here, so we consider the Hamiltonian. And it, it's going to be a, a little bit more general. So it's going to be a, fa a one parameter family, H lambda H. So lambda is uh, the, the lattice, H the, the external magnetic field in the third direction. It depends on a little parameter U. And it's going to be given by the following, minus 2 sum of the nearest neighbors, so x, y in the set of edges. And then sx1, sy1, plus u, sx2, sy2, plus sx3, sy3, and uh, minus h sum of x in lambda, sx3. So there, there, there are many motivations for, for this. Uh, I see some people frowning because that's not completely the standard conventions. One would put the asymmetric parameter over here. But it turns out to be better for reflection positivity and other applications. But anyway, so the, let me describe the special cases. So first, if you choose u equals plus 1, you get uh, the ferromagnetic Heisenberg model. Uh, I hope it's clear. There, there is a parameter 2 up front, but of course it plays, uh, it's not very important. It's going to be useful for us later. Then you have uh, the case u equals 0. And this is an interesting model. It's called the xy model, or also quantum rotator model. I'm going to, to keep calling it xy. xy refers to, to somehow, I mean, if you label the, the spin directions as x, y, z, then uh, you say that you retain two of them, which is x and y. Here it would be something like x, z, but uh, never mind. So people would call it x, y. Then the case, u equals minus y, minus 1. This is uh, essentially the Heisenberg anti-ferromagnetic, anti ferromagnet So more precisely, it's unitarily equivalent to H antiferromagnet on bipartite graphs. So I'm not going to, to give you the details, but the idea is that using those kind of things, you can introduce a unitary operator U such that you apply it to, to this thing and you get the Heisenberg antiferromagnet. You can rotate spins in two directions, so that you, you change the, the signs of both this and this, and you get the Heisenberg anti magnet. This is something really important to, to, to do, so I really urge you to, to do it. It works only on uh, bipartite graphs, because you have to do it on a sublattice, and, um, and then you, you get it. So this is the model we are going to study, and we'll prove at some point uh, that the, there is a phase transition to a ferromagnetic phase here, which would correspond to anti ferromagnetism in the original model. I hope everything is clear so far. So then I'd like to, to discuss the, the first important thing, which is the thermodynamic limit and the notion of phase transitions. So just to make sure, am I allowed to use the, this side? Oh, I don't see anything. I assume I can. Um, so the, the first thing is to understand the free energy. At the beginning, I, I pointed out that such free energy exists by the second principle of thermodynamics. Now we do statistical mechanics. So we have a Hilbert space. We have Schrodinger equations in the background. I mean, we have a Hamiltonian. 
the question is how to define the, the thermodynamic free energy. And this, is, uh, this goes back to, to ideas of Boltzmann, essentially, who, who, who wrote a definition for, for the entropy out of microscopic description. And then it can be extrapolated and extended. And then we get the formula for the free energy. So the free energy of the system is given by, and uh, let me write the F lambda to remind that we are at finite uh, volume. It depends on beta and H, and it's going to be like uh, minus one over beta lambda logarithm of the trace of exponential minus beta H lambda of H and this parameter U. And the trace is in the Hilbert space H lambda. So, so this does not look, I mean, it looks pretty innocuous, but uh, this is really something absolutely fundamental. I mean, there's a lot of fault behind justifying this, uh, this equation, and certainly the story has not been fully written yet. But we are definitely going to accept that this gives uh, the free energy for equilibrium systems uh, with Hamiltonian H, and at inverse temperature beta. So, so then, uh, as we noticed here, the, the idea of a phase transition is that something should happen to F. Here it was a smooth function, and here it has a, a, a discontinuous first derivative. So in general, phase transitions are associated with non-analyticity behavior of the free energy. Now you can check that this function here is pretty much analytic everywhere. Well, you would have to, to worry about the log, but uh, even this is not a problem because you have, uh, I mean, these things start at one in, anyway. So, so in order to get non-analytic uh, behavior, you need to go to the so-called thermodynamic limit. So we'll accept these ideas, which took a while to, to be accepted, which is that um, um, in order to get phase transitions, we need to take the infinite volume limit. Actually, what was difficult to accept is not that we need it, but what we are justified in doing so. So the idea is that uh, lambda is going to be a box, and we take the, the size to infinity. And we have divided uh, uh, everything by one over lambda. Everything is supposed to, to scale nicely, so that there is a limiting function, which will be the, the right one to describe the free energy of a very large system. So the first thing is to get uh, existence of this, um, of this limit. So I'm going to continue. So I need to find the eraser here. Yeah, nicely aligned. And let me continue here. So this is a fundamental theorem which really open, uh, open the fields of, uh, field of mathematical statistical mechanics. The theorem is due to, to essentially Ruel, but uh, Fischer was also very important. And I'm going to give you only a special case. So let uh, lambda L equals to 1 L to the D and E the set of nearest neighbors for, for the edges. And the claim is that then, if you consider F lambda L, according to the definition over there, beta H, then it converges as L in goes to infinity to a function F of beta h and convergence is uniform on compact sets. 
So compact sets for, for beta and H, and indeed you have uniform convergence as L tends to, to infinity. I don't have time to, to do it in details, but I'm still going to, to give you the main idea. I guess I still have about 10 minutes. And so the proof uses a subadditive argument. It's good to say it because, again, it's one of those things. You see it once, you understand it once, and then it's pretty clear next time how to, to do it. But otherwise, it would definitely take a while before one comes with a, the right perspective. The picture is the following. We are going to, to take a, a big box to infinity, but suppose we understand it as being made of smaller boxes. So, so this is a two-dimensional system because it's easier to depict. Here, this is going to be L, but then we, we also have uh, other diverging scales like N and some remainder R. So L is going to be like an integer times N plus R and R has to be smaller than N. Okay, we are going to take L to infinity, but also N to infinity. And, uh, and then the idea is that you write the free energy with a Hamiltonian involving interactions all over. So this is supposed to be the, the lattice. I mean, you have uh, really a grid. I hope it's clear. And uh, you can use... Um, basic operator inequalities, I mean, the minimax uh, principles, to, to forget the interactions between those different boxes, and you just pay uh, something which is not too important. And then if you do this, you can compare the energy, the free energy in those boxes with, with, with the one on the whole. And so the thing is that uh, one can show, and in, in the notes, uh, it's, uh, it's written with much more details. But uh, here, let me just give you the, what one can show, which is that f of lambda l of beta h is less or equals than kn over l to the d uh, times f of lambda n beta h. This is essentially how many boxes you have times this thing on the small box lambda n, and you just have a 1 over LD um, somewhere and 1 over ND to, to play with. And uh, I mean, KD is actually the number of boxes. And then you have corrections plus KD, D, N, D minus 1, as it turns out, LD times a constant C plus D square R over L times another constant C, which does not depend on L or N. Okay. And uh, this is essentially a sub-additive property because, um, well, if you have a notion of sub-additive sequence, you know that the, the whole is less than the sum of its parts. And here you have essentially the sum of its parts and some corrections which uh, turn out not to be very important. And then you take the first, first thing is to take L to infinity in this inequality here. So, and we take the limb soup because we don't know whether things converge. So what you get is that the limb soup L tends to infinity of this F lambda L beta H. And it can be shown that it does not diverge. I mean, some, just some rough bounds uh, prove that. And this is less or equals. So what do you get over here? You can check that uh, all this thing converges to, to, um, to, to one because this uh, little thing turns out not to be very important. Um, so then this gives you f lambda n of beta h. Then here you can check that it converges to 1 over n, essentially, or plus, uh, more precisely, d over n c, because you have a kd, I mean kd nd over ld, this converges to 1, so you still have a 1 over n over here, and this goes to 0. And then you take the limit n tends to infinity, 
But this time we take the limb in for, for this thing, and what we get is that the limb soup, f lambda l of beta h, l tends to infinity, is less or equals than the limb in, n tends to infinity of f lambda n beta h. And this proves the existence of a limit. The limb soup is less than the limb inf. So it's really a nice argument which you see for if you have a sequence of numbers satisfying a subadditivity property, then the numbers divided by n uh, converge. But that's exactly this. And then you get uniform convergence on compact uh, sets by using the Arzela Ascoli theorem. You can prove that uh, the, the sequence is equicontinuous so that you can apply this theorem. I'm not going to, to do it. I still have a couple of minutes to, to describe. Uh, yeah, let me continue here. To describe all the parameters for phase transitions. So here we have established something extremely important, namely that uh, we have a Hamiltonian and we have the notion of free energy given over here. We can take the infinite volume limit. We'd like to, to understand properties, in particular to prove that something happens, that there is a phase transition. But the, the problem is, uh, I mean, the, the function f exists. So now what should we look look at so phase transitions and all the parameters and I'm going to introduce M lambda for the, the operator for the total magnetization so we sum over all sides of a domain SX free in the third direction and there are three natural Free natural order parameters. So I'm not going to define what an order parameter is. Basically, a function which tells you uh, which phase you are in. So first, uh, and I'm going to, to give you several definitions at once, because if you look at the literature, you will find one or the other, and at some point you get confused what is exactly proved and and uh, which order, which parameter to look at. Something which one can define as the thermodynamic magnetization. Which is the one you, you get out of uh, thermodynamic potential, so the free energy. Let me write this as m star th, it depends on beta, which is uh, minus the derivative from the right of f of beta h at h equals zero. That's a derivative respect to h from the right. So that's exactly the picture over there. We differentiate from the right. The question is whether it's flat, the derivative is zero, or whether it's strictly positive. If it's not zero, it's positive by concavity. Then there is something which one can call residual magnetization, uh, which is the following, m star res of beta. And it's something also quite uh, intuitive. Suppose you look at the, the Gibbs state of this operator over here. I haven't introduced the equilibrium Gibbs state. This means uh, uh, 1 over the trace of exponential minus beta h, trace of m exponential minus beta h. I'm not putting the lambdas. OK, I, I assume that everybody knows what the quantum Gibbs state is. So. So, so basically, you have your, your magnet, I mean your, your material, and you, you measure the total magnetization in the third direction. But you do it with uh, some parameter h, which is not zero. So you put the magnetic field. Then the first thing is to take the limb, let's take the limb in if we don't know whether it exists, of infinite uh, volume. So L tends to, to infinity. And then we take h goes to, to zero by positive values. If you revert the limits, then you'll get that this is zero by symmetry. But like that, you still have a possibility of retaining things. And it's really physical. I mean, you, you put your system in a magnetic field, 
you remove the magnetic field, the question is whether you, you keep the magnetization. And uh, next, uh, something which is closer to what we are going to actually look, spontaneous magnetization. This time we look at, uh, at an expectation directly with h equals zero. But since uh, the expectation of m is zero, we take the expectation of the absolute value of, uh, of the operator m. And, oh, I, I forgot to take the lim inf as L tends to, to infinity, and we divide by one over the volume. So we look at the expectation of this, but we divide by the volume and we take the limit. Let me just give you two more propositions, but they are short, and I'm not going to prove them. This is proposition 1.6 in the notes which is that uh, one can compare those uh, order parameters and prove that they are quite equivalent. More precisely, one can prove that m star th beta is equal to m star residual beta, and this is larger or equal than m star spontaneous beta. And I'm not going to prove it, but I urge you to, to do it. This is a really nice proof using uh, just the convexity properties of functions. And this, gives, uh, this uses a bit more of a quantum mechanical setting. And the second uh, result, lemma 1.7, turns out that um, we are going to consider these kind of things. I forgot to say h equals 0 here. We are going to consider this kind of thing but uh, not quite. What we are going to, to look at is rather the expectation of m, m square. So we can prove the following. Take the expectation of absolute value of m lambda over lambda at h equals 0, and you take the square of this, of this order parameter, when this is less or equals than m lambda over lambda, everything to the square, in the, the expectation of a Gibbs state, and less or equals than S m lambda over lambda at h equals 0. Everything is at h equals 0. And why is it interesting? Because this is something quite relevant. When you expand the m lambda, it's the sum over x. You take to the square, so you get sum over x, y. So this is something like the sum over x, y, and 1 over lambda square. And then you have a the correlation function which shows up, sx3, sy3. And uh, this is essentially, and th this is the object that we are going to, to prove is non-zero when we do a reflection positivity and infrared bounds. So using that this is non-zero, this suggests that this has to be non-zero. So according to this definition, the m star spontaneous is non-zero, and also all other parameters are non-zero. So we are indeed going to prove a uh, the, the nice thing. OK, so, so I hope it's, uh, you are quite happy with those definitions. And remind, I mean, reflect on this, because this is going to be a, something very important. And we are going to, to work a lot on the correlation functions uh, from now on. Thank you.